नाथमृत तम सजीव साइत सवदूत परिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य कृष्ण पद सह घन ललिता श्री विशाखाता नम ओं विष्णुपादाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नाम नमस्ते सारस्वते देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणी निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिणी हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमस्तुते तप्त कांचन गौरांगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानुसुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचा कल्पतरो कृपा सिंधु पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासादी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण सो वेलकम टू द नेक्टर ऑफ इंस्ट्रक्शन भक्ति शास्त्र क्लास yesterday we began the discussion on text 5 and text 5 mentions how madhyam adhikari does trivida seven seven of the seva of the kashya and the uttama so yesterday we <coughs> discuss the context or the flow Or the link between text four and text five, and after that we discuss the overview of the different themes in the purport to text five, and before we went into the text five, we discuss these terminologies: kanishta dikari, madhya madikari, and uttam dikari. These are not fixed terminologies, and the general definition of who is kanishta, madhya, and uttam we saw based on the nine stages of bhakti. and there are other finer terminologies like kanishta madhyam 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 uttam and within uttam also there is uttam kanishta uttam madhyam uttam uttam and then we went into how these terminologies are been used uh, by root go swami in bhakti rasamrit sindhu what is his definition of a uttam adhikari madhyam adhikari and a kanishta then how again the same root go swami uses these terminologies in nectar of instruction and they have a different context there and then we also saw from the bhagavatam perspective the bhagavat definition of uttama kanishta and madhyam is quite different and then the sanatan shiksha which is parallel to bhakti rasamrit sindhu and the kulina gramvasis which is parallel to the nectar of instruction and we all put this in the chart here if you see and then the application of it the classification basis of what what is the classification basis of all these definitions on of these books and what is the application so that is how we discussed um, uh, these uh, terminologies kanishta madhyam uttama and then we went into the purport so in the purport proper in the first paragraph gives the verse theme and the general definitions of kanishta madhyam and uttam then prabhupada says one should not remain kanishta whose definition he gives from the bhagavatam one should rise to the madhyam so who is a madhyama he gives in the bhagavatam definition now 
it is only madhyama who can treat various devotees uh, differently and how the madhyama treats the prakrit sahajyas those who are innocent and those who are neophyte devotees these three categories how does he treat them so this is where we finished our discussion yesterday so today we will continue the discussion now in the next paragraph onwards yeah yeah this is the next paragraph the theme is we are continuing with the theme of discussion that is uh, understanding the three kinds of vaishnavas and offering respect respects as per rupa goswami's definition of noi that is four to nine paragraphs so we have discussed paragraph 4 and now we will discuss paragraph 5 let us go to paragraph 5 sorry in this krishna conscious movement a chance is given to everyone without discrimination of caste creed or color everyone is invited to join this movement sit with us take prasad and hear about krishna when we see that someone is actually interested in krishna consciousness and wants to be initiated we accept him as a disciple for chanting the holy name of the lord so here we see many come to the temple they just come to the temple have darshan and they go back some might come to the temple to hear and then take prasad and then they will go back but there will be few among these crowd who will really take interest in the philosophy and i also want to become a devotee and practice and they take up to practice operate regularly attending satsang courses and they start following the regulative principles the four regulative principles and chanting of hari krishna and they are like devotees now and they become also interested to become initiated so then prabhupad says at that time uh, the spiritual master can accept him as a disciple and for chanting the holy name so which diksha this prabhupad is referring to here uh, in this statement anyone would like to answer can raise their hands and if you have to type in the chat box directly only send the message to me so which kind of initiation which is the initiation proper is referring to here anyone would like to answer can raise your hand yeah so dhanalakshmi mata ji has given a correct answer what about others which type of initiation proper is speaking about yes yes many have typed in the chat box correct so that is called as the hari naam initiation so now my question to you is is for chanting the hari krishna maha mantra is it required that we should take hari naam initiation is it necessary yes or no <laughs> yes many have answering this as no and i am surprised i am very very surprised by the answers mohan roop sham prabhu has typed yes <laughs> okay so actually we don't need initiation to chant the hari krishna mantra there is no need to take initiation because before initiation also we start chanting the hari krishna mantra and we see that we find the effects that our heart is getting transformed we are following the regulative principles but initiation is necessary in a sense that <clears throat> i give the example this is a very elaborate topic in fact uh, i give a one hour talk on this one verse which is mentioned in the chaitanya charitamrita diksha purashara vidhi vina 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saying, without any diksha, without any purificatory processes, one can take the name and go back to Godhead. So uh, uh, Mahaprabhu is saying in Chaitanya Charitamrit. And then Srila Prabhupada in his purports goes on to give maybe from the Shastras 15, 16 references of how initiation is important. <laughs> Verse is saying initiation is not required. But Prabhupada goes on to say how initiation is required. Now sometimes it is very bewildering why Prabhupada is saying that. For many years even I was not aware. So the reason it is required is the Hare Krishna Mahamantra is so potent, it's so pure that anyone can take the Hare Krishna Mahamantra chant and only when he comes to the platform of Shuddha Naam, when he takes the Shuddha Naam, he can go back to Godhead. But in the 18th and the 19th century, there were so many upper sampradayas. We all know that. Bhaktivinoda Thakur's time. There were 13 upper sampradayas he identified. All were taking the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. But yet they were committing a lot of offenses. They were engaged in all illicit activities. So if you have got the medicine, but if you chant Nama Parad and you don't take Shuddha Nam, then this great treasure by which taking the holy name, you can go back to God and you will use it. So I compare it like a heart surgery. A doctor who is expert in heart surgery sees that the patient requires an heart operation. And he has to undergo the heart operation in order for him to survive. But there are other parameters he has to see before he gets operated. If the BP is low or if he has diabetes or there are other parameters which are not proper, then he cannot perform the operation. And if he doesn't perform the operation, ultimately the patient will die. Similarly, we are so deeply conditioned with so many bad habits. <clears throat> the Hare Krishna Mahamantra has the potency to purify us fully. But because of our deep-rooted conditionings, uh, even if we take the Mahamantra, we will take with offenses and we need to regulate the mind to chant Shudhanam. So that is why uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, thought it is best in the Western countries that they should take serious uh, this chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And that's why he made it very, very clear. 16 rounds and four regulator principles for taking Harinam Diksha. But during that time in the Gaudiya months, uh, anyone who showed interest to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, you know, they used to give the mala and say, you chant. They should just chant on the mala and give. There was no initiation, official initiation required for that. Because they were sincere and they used to, you know, uh, later on uh, understand the Nama Tattva, regularly attend satsang. And ultimately, if you get chance to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra and you don't take Shuddha Nam, ultimately you lose the opportunity. But what was happening in the 18th and 19th century, all over Orissa and Bengal, they were all chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And all these Jat Gosais who were mentoring Gaurita deities, they were like, you know, they were giving mantra. They said, you know, we are qualified to give mantra. We are born, born in Goswami families. Only we have the right and monopoly to distribute the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And they were not interested in the teachings of the actual Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. And they were telling, you want whatever sin you want, you just do. Commit all types of sinful activities, but still continue taking the holy name. Ajamil, throughout his life, he committed sin. But ultimately, he went back to Godhead. So you also keep on committing sin and you'll go back to Godhead. So this kind of concocted philosophies they were spreading. And that is why Bhakti Vinod Thakur uh, mentioned that there are different levels of chanting. There is Nama Prad, Nama Bhas, Shuddha Nam. If one chants Nama Prad, then he will remain in the material world. Or he might also degrade by committing sinful activities while chanting the holy name. He might commit Nama Prad. 
So all this tattva bhakti no Thakur has established. And that is why two things are important for us to understand. The patient requires the heart surgery, but the body has so many other parameters which are not proper. Just like there is diabetes, the sugar levels are not proper. So the doctor is not able to do the operation of the heart surgery. Similarly, the first initiation and the second initiation prepare the body of the sadhaka. They prepare the body of the sadhaka to become very regulated. And especially the second initiation, which is given for deity worship. The second initiation is given for deity worship because in Kaliuga, our minds are very, very disturbed, fickle. So to attain steadiness, constantly engaging our senses in the deity worship helps us to study the mind so that ultimately we can chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So all this first initiation and second initiation help us to come to a steady mind where we are situated in the mode of goodness and then we can you know, become free from Nama Prad, come to the Nama Bha stage and chant Shudhanam. And that is like the heart operation where the heart is fully transformed and pure love for Krishna awakens and go back to Godhead. This is one reason. The second aspect of what I say is initiation by the spiritual master is one of the limbs of devotion because that is how we get connected to the Guru Shish Parampara. That is most important. Secondly, we already have faith. We are in association of devotees. We are doing bhajan and we are to a certain degree, we are getting the benefits of chanting. Our heart is transforming. But the spiritual master, when he initiates the disciple, our faith gets a boost. So that is required. That faith of boost by which we are pushed to attain Krishna Prem, by which we can become free from the anarthas. So that is how we should see this. And this, this is how Prabhupada explains in that uh, purport of the Chaitanya Charitamrit. So when one becomes seriously interested, then you know he becomes a candidate for first initiation. So this is uh, Prabhupada is speaking about the first initiation there. Then Prabhupada says, one. When a neophyte devotee is actually initiated, when we say he becomes fit for being initiated, he says, and when he is actually initiated and engaged in devotional service by the order of the spiritual master, he should be immediately, he should he, sh, he should be accepted immediately as a bona fide Vaishnava. So here is <clears throat> the initiation is a two-way process. The spiritual master accepts the disciple uh, that I will take responsibility for the disciple uh, for his spiritual development and the disciple also surrenders to the spiritual master and uh, uh, he mentions or he expresses his willingness to serve the spiritual master, serve and follow the orders of the spiritual master. So it is a two-way process. Uh, you cannot have this whole Rithik philosophy where, you know, after Prabhupada has left, they say we are directly taking initiation from Prabhupada. But is Prabhupada accepting you as a disciple? <laughs> so initiation is a two-way process. It's not a one-way process. So there are two things here. We should, you know, the connection, the connection is of the heart. Now here heart, I mean the soul. The soul actually surrenders to the spiritual master. And he engages in devotional service, follows the orders of the spiritual master. Then Prabhupada says we should accept him as a bona fide Vaishnava. And such a bona fide Vaishnava, Prabhupada says, obeisances should be offered to him. <laughs> now he gives another higher understanding. Out of many such Vaishnavas, Many such Vaishnavas means many such bona fide Vaishnavas who are initiated. One may be found to be very seriously engaged in the service of the Lord, strictly following the regulative principles, chanting the prescribed number of rounds on Japa base, 
and always thinking of how to expand the Krishna conscious movement. Such a Vaishnava should be accepted as a Uttamadikari, a highly advanced devotee. And his association should always be sought. So Prabhupada is here uh, giving a hint. This is not exactly like the definition of a Uttamadikari from the Shastri perspective, but what are the symptoms we see in this Uttamadikari? What is it? Very seriously engaged in the service of the Lord. Strictly following the regulative principles. Chanting the prescribed number of rounds. Always thinking of how to expand the Krishna conscious movement. So these are four criteria Prabhupada is giving here. Okay. So I'll just finish this paragraph and take up this question. And he is said to be a Uttamadikari, a highly advanced devotee and his association should always be sought. So this is what Prabhupada is saying here. Okay. So there are some questions, but let me first uh, finish this. Now, in this paragraph, what Prabhupada has mentioned, I have again put it in the chart. You can see here. Uh, we had seen this chart yesterday. Now let us see in this next paragraph what Prabhupada is saying. Paragraph 5. Mm -hmm. Understanding of three kinds of Vaishnavas and offering respect as per Rupa Goswami's definition in NOI. In that paragraph 5. Madhyam Adhikari dealing with bona fide Vaishnavas. The Prakriti Sahajyas are not bona fide Vaishnavas. So they are dealing how Madhyam Adhikari deals. The Prakriti Sahajyas, they are not bona fide Vaishnavas. We should respect them in their mind, avoid their association. The innocent are not still bona fide Vaishnavas. We, uh, we preach to them and uh, we give them instructions. These are the neophyte devotees, the Kanishta. But here now he is speaking about bona fide Vaishnavas. So the bona fide Vaishnavas are they, are, they are serious devotees. They are engaged in the devotional service. They are taken Diksha. They are following sincerely the order of the spiritual master. They are bona fide Vaishnavas. So the Madhya Madhikari offers obeisances to him. Dikshasti Chet Panatabish Bhajantam Nisha. And then Prabhupada mentioned about there are Uttam Adhikaris, and these are the you know four, three are there, but four it is actually very seriously engaged in the Lord's service, strictly following the regulatory principles, chanting the prescribed number of nouns, and always spreading the Krishna conscious movement. So should be offered respectful obeisances. So this is how uh, when we study Prabhupada purpose, we should very scrutinizingly study and see and understand. Okay, there are two questions. So one is, Poonam Mataji has asked a question, what is Harinam initiation? Harinam initiation in ISKCON is called as, what is called as first initiation. The second initiation is called as the uh, uh, Mantra Diksha. <clears throat> Harinam initiation is called as first initiation. The second initiation is called as Mantra Diksha. Uh, Harinam Diksha, Mantra Diksha. Harinam Diksha, Prabhupada established this very strictly in ISKCON that those who have come in touch with the preaching of ISKCON and they are chanting 16 rounds following the regulative principles, then they are initiated with the holy name. The spiritual master uh, chants beads on the beads and he gives the Nama Diksha. And this is Harinam initiation. Ultimately, it is meant for preparing for second initiation. Because second initiation by which, you know, we can engage more in deity service so that the senses and the minds become steady. So that ultimately, we can chant the holy name. Please remember, all this is there for chanting the holy name. Harinam initiation is given so that we take the holy name very seriously. Because... Uh, the holy name is a well-known mantra all over the world now. It was well-known in Odisha and Bengal. Even the Dhobiwala, you know, while washing the clothes, he would chant the holy name. <laughs> but how to chant? What move to chant? What is the pranali? What is the method? Bhakti Yana Thakur mentions, one of the verses mentions, what is the pranali? What is the methodology to chant? If you chant, Without offenses only, 
then you can go to the higher level and take shubhanam and get liberated otherwise you might chant millions of lives and you will not get the result so the spiritual master gives the nama diksha and he also gives the nama tattva he explains the glories of the holy names by which we seriously chant holy name the second initiation as i mentioned is mantra diksha by which we become qualified uh, as brahmanas and we take up to deity worship those who are in the family uh, it is proper that recommends that they all should uh, have deities at home and even if they are not having second initiation they can still do deity service because the uh, the family deities house deities are part of your family so in that sense you can you know continue with your deity services even if you have not got the second initiation by sincerely serving the deities uh, uh, we we get that purity absolutely there is no doubt about it so that is the answer for uh, Uh, question regarding what is hari nam initiation uh, there is one more question asked by the name is not here in here ha ah, yes ratna mata ji shri vali ratna mata ji yes mata ji hari krishna prabhu uh, here it says uttam adhikari when we talk there are three points here and the mm-hmm. third point says think always thinking of how to expand krishna consciousness but mm-hmm. when we were talking about uttam adhikari yesterday we saw that uh, usually they are not people who come down to the madhyam adhikari level because they think everything is already uh, i mean uh, i don't remember how you exactly put it but everything is already krishna ha- is uh, the controller of it so yeah. expanding doesn't make sense to a uttam adhikari that's why we were talking all this in the sense from the perspective of a madhyam adhikari okay yeah so how uh, does this apply to a uttam adhikari and in what yeah. context yes very interesting question yesterday also the students also asked me this question after the class now uttam adhikari when we speak let us speak from the bhagavat perspective from the shrimad bhagavatam vision the uttam adhikari's vision is that he sees the supreme lord in all beings and all beings are situated within the lord and in that sense he sees everyone is sheltered by the lord it's not that everyone is a vaishnava everyone is under the lord shelter that is his vision because of his pure vision so he sees like that the uttam adhikari and he sees that everyone is advanced except me <laughs> now this you know it doesn't fit in our tiny brains now just to give an example if you have uh, come across the 10th canto especially the gopis you know glorifying uh the flute they are thinking that the bamboo tree is so exalted he is such a mahabhagavat he is constantly taking the association of krishna because the bamboo flute uh is being getting the nectar of krishna's other amrit his nectarian lips so how fortunate how advanced is the bamboo tree now the bamboo tree is not a jiva <laughs> in one sense is not in the human form i feel i'm telling you not, not that they are all jivas but they see everything as conscious as conscious you know and everything is conscious being in the spiritual world if you see even the milk which is boiling uh, which mother yashoda has kept it is a conscious being it's saying oh what is the use if krishna is going to drink only mother yashoda's milk then what is the use of my milk my life is useless let me commit suicide so the milk starts overflowing <laughs> so the milk is also a conscious being so these uttam adhikaris which we are speaking is on a very very different level of platform which we can call as the mahabhagavats who come from the eternal world now they have that vision but <clears throat> krishna has his purpose 
that you know let them preach my message so the uttam adhikari who is having this pure vision krishna breaks that vision krishna breaks that vision so that they come down to the madhyama platform where then they can you know uh, discriminate and distinguish and then only they can preach but still although they come down to the madhyam platform but still they are uttam adhikaris please remember that they are still uttam adhikaris so but their vision is uh, uh, vision is lower down and this happens by the internal arrangement with krishna the internal potency so yesterday i was explaining to the students i was giving the example of how in the 11th chapter of the bhagavad gita veer is the vishvadoop darshan yoga in the vishvadoop darshan yoga what is happening arjuna before that he is related to krishna and sakha he is very intimately connected to krishna as krishna's friend but then when he has the desire to see the vishvarupa the vishvarupa is not a uh, divine form in the form of a uh, form which is there in, as sham sundar krishna but it is the form which is part of the material manifestation but the vishvarupa is spiritual because krishna himself manifest that form so but it is a <coughs> celestial vision we call it as a celestial vision so arjuna from his pure prema vision where arjuna is related to krishna in the form of saka he comes down to the celestial vision in order to see this vishwarup and then one who is related to this friend he starts praying to him you know please forgive me i treated you as my friend sometimes has to chat with you has to you know pat on you you are the supreme lord i did not know that so his vision comes down from the transcendental vision or the prema chakshu to the devata vision or what we call it as the celestial vision similarly the mahabhagavats who are completely related to the lord in rasa pure spiritual rasa krishna breaks that vision and brings them to a lower vision by which they can they have the same you know prema for the lord but now they develop that compassion otherwise they are completely in uh, they are completely in union with the lord and experiencing rasa so they are completely cut off aloof you know they are cut off from this world then krishna's mission will not be accomplished so this is how uh, it happens that although they are on the prema stage they come down to a different level of vision so that uh, krishna's mission is accomplished so this is how it happens and those uttam adhikaris who from sadhana gradually gradually elevate uh, from nishta ruchi asakti bhava prema of course their visions go to higher and higher levels but uh, because there is instruction by the founder acharya to preach the message the uh, showing compassion jiva daya is most prominent and that is very dear to krishna so that is why they also preach sometimes i am just giving an example because i personally had one interaction with one sanyasi so he was saying that although uh, there is so much naam ras they have they have so much they derive so much nectar in chanting the holy names you know, that they can you know sit whole day and chant 32 rounds for you know 48 rounds 64 rounds but they reduce their rounds in the sense that they don't reduce it below 60 16 but they reduce they do minimum number of rounds what is recommended and show compassion by preaching because that is an higher activity which is pleasing to krishna are you getting this point i hope it is clear mata ji <laughs> okay so there is one more question i will take up mohan lal prabhu ji yes mohan lal prabhu ji hari krishna prabhu ji yeah ah uh, prabhu ji yesterday also it was some thing about it today just one more sir you told this deity worship 
so can be done by the second uh, after second initiation so daily workshop we cannot do at home like a uh, guru uh, or say a first after first initiation at home also uh, as i mentioned now just in the class that uh, those who are grahasthas even if they are uh, not second initiated they can still do daily workshop what to speak even if you are not first initiated there are many devotees who have uh, duties at home and they are worshiping it is all depending on our you know our deep faith and ultimately we take the blessings of our spiritual mentors or our um, uh, spiritual masters and call them for the program and uh, uh, you know and do the abhishek of the deities and continue with the worship it's all depends on one seriousness of how serious you are you to practice the spiritual life so dt worship is recommended uh, especially for grahasthas i have a friend of mine who just came in touch 2 3 years back and he has dt's in his home and all his family members are engaged full time taking care of the dt's that's how you know they are all sense engagement so you advance very quickly by that and it is very surprising all his children you know they only do the abhishek they do the dt dressing right from their childhood so and it has uh, it uh, purifies our senses very quickly although uh, uh, bhakti you know thakur mentions even while doing dt worship like if you are doing the aarti of the dt although the soul is engaged in the dt worship and we can be in that consciousness still there is you know uh, in our consciousness we realize that we have this body little the deha buddhi will be there but bhakti no thakur says while chanting you can transcend that also <laughs> you might be not conscious that you are having a body that kind of you know potency is there in the chanting but we are not at that platform <laughs> that you know we chant and few hours we are lost <laughs> we don't have that concentration levels especially in this age of distraction so i told you just 300 400 years back even mahaprabhu's associates they would go inside the caves to just free be free from the distractions so that they can absorb themselves in the holy name now you know what is today's situation where we have millions of distractions so this has this potency is there in the holy name but dt worship will help us to regulate our mind and senses and it is very important that we do it okay so we'll continue the discussion now this is paragraph 5 we have discussed now let us go to paragraph 6 so after explaining uh, how one is initiated and how one becomes actually initiated prabhupada in uh, this next paragraph explains the process of initiation <laughs> he gives two definitions one from the chaitanya charitamrita and one from the bhakti sandarbha of shri jeev goswami so both these i have uh, put here paragraph 6 diksha definition diksha kale bhakt kare atma samarpan sei kale krishna tare kare atma samar at the time of initiation diksha kale when a devotee fully surrenders to the service of the lord bhakta kare atma samarpan krishna accepts him to be as good as he himself se kale krishna kare krishna tara kare atma samarpan now here uh, i have actually if you see translated this verse from chaitanya charitamrita because here proper uh yeah i have tried to translate from here so now in this uh, translation which is the most important word here <laughs> when will krishna consider that devotee as good as himself sei kale krishna kare tara kare atma sama he is he is like me me himself in the bhagavad gita krishna tells neither shiva is dear to me brahma is dear to me nor sankarshan as much as you are dear to me with love he says that kind of so here which is the most important word here in the translation 
आत्मसमर्पण यस आत्मसमर्पण बट आई वॉन्ट हियर इन द ट्रांसलेशन वेर आई है ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ दिस वर्ड्स हियर इन दिस ट्रांसलेशन विच इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट वर्ड वेन यू थिंक कृष्णा विल कंसिडर हिम एज गुड एज हिमसेल्फ which is the word here in the english translation dhan lakshmi mata ji yes ah uh, when he fully surrenders himself ah yes it is fully surrenders so our surrender process begins when we surrender to the spiritual master and take initiation it begins that surrender is a process and that is why it begins with initiation initiation means you initiate the process it not ends it initiates you started that is why arjuna surrenders to our krishna in bhagavad gita 2.7 but ultimately that surrender reaches the pinnacle in 18.66 that fully surrendered so only when he fully surrenders then krishna accepts him as good as himself so this is a very important and a lot of uh, uh, discussion was happening uh, in the iskon uh, <laughs> there is a shastrik advisory committee of the gbc in the gbc the discussion was happening oh how is it that just by diksha uh, krishna atma samarpan is it like no. when you fully atma samarpan when he samarpan means what fully surrenders that is what in the navida bhakti is called as atma nivedanam so atma nivedanam is not so easy you know rupa swami mentions in the bhakti rasamrita sindhu that among the nine limbs of devotion uh, dasyam sakyam atma nivedanam in that he says sakyam and atma nivedanam are very difficult to perform as sadhana <laughs> it's very difficult it's not so easy he says Hmm. Now here there is one more question. Diksha means first or second initiation. I will answer that. Let us take the second definition. Then it will become clear. Diksha. We have a, a very narrow conception of what is diksha. But here in the definition, definition of diksha is given. Diksha definition. Devyam jnanam yato dadyat oryat papasya sankasham. संकटलीस्ट्रॉय a person a person expert in the study of revealed scriptures deshike is tatva kovida tatva kovida means one who is expert in the study of tatva knows this process as diksha tasmat dikshayati sa prokta that is how he defines as diksha now diksha here means divyam gyanam the moment you somehow came in touch with your friends who took you to the hari krishna temple you heard a lecture and you attended a course all there what you were getting was transcendental knowledge some people when they hear about the law of karma they immediately give up mean immediately so in that sense it is diksha why because he was given transcendental knowledge and he immediately Heard the transcendental knowledge, and he give up give up his bad habits. So Papa is being slowly destroyed. Gradually, it is being destroyed because of getting transcendental knowledge. So this is a very broad understanding of Diksha. So Sri La Prabhupad, in one of his letter to his disciple, says that <clears throat> when I first time met my spiritual master Sri La Bhakti Siddhanta Sarvesh Thakur. and <clears throat> bhakti siddhant sarvesh thakur gave the order that preach in the western countries lord chaitanya's message 
Prabhupada knew, knew about Lord Chaitanya. He knew about the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So Prabhupada said, who will take your message seriously? India is under <clears throat> British rule. India has to first become independent. So Bhakti Siddhan Saraswakur, from a transcendental perspective, explained what is real independence. And that transcendental knowledge, when Prabhupada heard, uh, it attracted his heart. And Prabhupada said, first time in his life, he was defeated in an argument. And that defeat, Prabhupada loved it. He said, I'm very happy that I'm defeated. And Prabhupada says in that letter that I accepted him as my spiritual master. So acceptance of the spiritual master is from, some, from the heart. Later on, it's only after 1922, then next is 1933 or 32, I think, where Prabhupada actually got initiated, both first and second. So real initiation is what? Transcendental knowledge. And this happens at different, different levels in our uh, journey in the spiritual life. First is when we uh, hear the Bhagavad Gita course over whichever temple we are connected to. And then later on, we take the Harinam initiation. And later on, we take the second initiation or we might not take also. And we come in touch with a devotee whom can understand. Uh, we might like his presentations. And we start getting transcendental knowledge from him. And we start considering him as our Shiksha Guru. And we start uh, taking instructions from him on how to advance in spiritual life. So that is also Divya Gyanu. So all this is what is actually a broad definition of Diksha. So it's not just the physical first initiation and second initiation, but it is actually Divya Gyanu. So Prabhupada's whole ISKCON system Prabhupada such it, set it in such a way that, you know, we have, you know, regular our satsangs, our courses, we have regular Bhagavatam. Every day we are hearing Bhagavatam and when we get newly enlightened about the subject, we are getting transcendental knowledge and the subtle impurities by which they are getting destroyed. So all that is also in one sense Diksha, Divyam Gyanam. So this is how we should understand uh, the definition of Diksha. So I hope uh, Sri Valli uh, Ratna Mataji had asked this question on the chat and uh, that becomes clear now. But still, there is one more question here. Yes, Mataji. One minute. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So oh. Uh, I understood the uh, definition of Diksha, but when I understand this, then I uh, have the doubt that how do you differentiate between your Siksha Guru and the Diksha Guru? Because if I understand that Diksha is only getting of transcendental knowledge, then I'm getting it from you, suppose. Mm -hmm. Then how do I differentiate it? Because no getting... Because if I'm getting the knowledge, the person from whom I'm getting it is my guru, mm -hmm. Diksha guru, because I'm getting the transcendental knowledge from that person. And in this uh, way, either you who is teaching me or else Srila Prabhupada, who, is, uh, who has written this book and, who, and you are translating it for me. So he is the Diksha guru and the Shiksha guru. Right? No. See, there are two types of gurus first, you have to understand. There is the Diksha guru and the Shiksha Guru. And both have functions. The Diksha Guru is one who gives the mantra, one who initiates us. He gives the mantra. And here mantra means second initiation for deity worship. Prabhupada also has introduced the first initiation. So in that sense, these are the Diksha Gurus. They also give the mantra. They give mantra and they can give transcendental knowledge. And by which uh, Kuryat Papa, Deva Gyanam, Kuryat Papa Sankasham happens. Then there is the Shiksha Guru. The Shiksha Guru doesn't give the mantra, but the Shiksha Guru gives instructions on transcendental knowledge for the disciple to advance in spiritual life. And that also, by that knowledge, Divyam Gyanam, Kurya Papa Sangasham is happening. So like that, we have these two types of uh, spiritual masters and they have two different functions. Sometimes even the Diksha Guru uh, 
can be your shiksha guru. And Prabhupada in the Chaitanya Charitamrit mentions it is best if, <clears throat> you know, again, not to make it complicated, but you have to understand there is something called as the Shravan Guru, the Shiksha Guru, and the Diksha Guru. The Shravan Guru is from whom you start hearing transcendental knowledge. Now, it was fortunate that Prabhupada heard transcendental knowledge from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur. And then later on, he started taking instructions from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur. In that sense, he acted as a Shiksha Guru. And later on, he took initiation also from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur. So he became his Diksha Guru. And after he took initiation also, he was taking instructions from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur. So in that sense, he was acting as a Shiksha Guru also. But it is also well known that Srila Prabhupada was also taking instruction from his very senior God brothers, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarita Guru God brothers, who were very elevated, Bhakti Pradya Keshav Maharaj and uh, Sridhar Maharaj. In fact, when Prabhupada wanted to take sannyas initiation, he consulted Bhakti Pradya Keshav Maharaj. And Bhakti Pradya Keshav Maharaj, yes, you should take it. So he has to consult. So in that, uh, it's a very broad understanding we should have about these Diksha and Shiksha Gurus. Now, Shiksha Guru, again, uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur mentions that both the Shiksha Guru and uh, Diksha Guru are the manifestation of Krishna. They are the manifestation of Krishna. Now, Shiksha Guru, again, is a very elevated uh, uh, devotee who is like a Mahabhagata Rottam Adhikari. But this is a, a precise definition, but there can be a broad definition also of a Shiksha Guru, one who, whom we take instructions also. He is giving us Shiksha. But Guru means, you know, it is like a Uttam Adhikari. So we have counsellors from whom we regularly take instructions. In one sense, they are acting as Shiksha Guru, but we cannot strictly term them as, uh, you know, uh, Uttam Adhikaris or Mahabhagavas who are manifestation of uh, Krishna. They are elevated devotees. They are like Madhya Madhikaris from whom we are taking instructions and they are guiding us in the spiritual life. So in a very broad way, they are also acting like Shiksha Gurus for us. So Prabhupada, uh, in this uh, definition, uh, uh, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there is verse. It mentions, Amara Agya, Guru Hobe Tara Edesh. By my instructions, you become a guru and you preach the holy name. So Prabhupada says there in the translation, devotee guru. <laughs> that means he's a devotee and he's preaching. He's preaching the message of Krishna. In that sense, he's acting like a guru, but he's not exactly like a guru who is a Mahabhagavad. But he's instructing about Krishna and connecting people to Krishna. So he's like a devotee guru, Prabhupada says. So like that, we have the counselor system who are instructing us in spiritual life. And then we can have actually sometimes very elevated uh, devotees whom we take personal guidance in our spiritual life who are very, very elevated in spiritual life for us. Or we might directly, if you are in touch with, with our spiritual master and Diksha Gurus, where we can take this kind of guidance in our spiritual life. So uh, because in the Iskian scenario, it is difficult for the Diksha Gurus to regularly uh, guide the disciples. So that's why there is a whole system. The morning Bhagavatam class, the counselor system, the Bhakti Vrikshas, the different groups. All this uh, helps us, the disciples, to get transcendental knowledge by which he can advance in spiritual life. I hope it is clear, Mataji. Kind of, Prabhu, not very sure. Yeah, but this... uh... Um, but like how you were saying that before even Srila Prabhupada, before he took the actual initiation, he uh, met and he accepted him in his heart because he could see that person in front of him. Then how does this come that you take uh, the, I mean, you attend somebody's classes and then a totally new person comes and you take Diksha from him. How do you accept uh, that? I mean, it may be off the topic, but you have not actually seen the person and like and how does that acceptance come Prabhu? See, usually in today's scenario, what happens is uh, uh, 
we might come in touch with some devotees and uh, and uh, hear uh, the message and take up the spiritual life later on in our practices we might hear from many spiritual masters in many sanyasis and we might get attracted to uh, some of the spiritual master who who's teaching we might feel that i can uh, uh, i can relate more and i am able to surrender to him and we might aspire from him to take initiation so that's how it happens so uh, nothing wrong in it you know and it's it, it, it is perfectly fine and later on after you take diksha from that spiritual master further in your spiritual life uh, you might come across a very advanced devotee who is uh, presenting uh, the subject very nicely and you are able to relate to him and you might take start taking instructions from him he might act as a shiksha guru so that also is possible and there is nothing wrong in that also so it's a very broad uh, way you have to understand this subject of course this is a very vast topic uh, and hari naam chintamani and other books speak a lot about it so that is my understanding about it now there is one more question surya kund prabhu or oh, there are a lot of questions today <laughs> because this subject is a vast topic and you know separate seminars have to be held for this because the uh, devotees don't understand uh, this subject actually everyone should read chaitanya charitamrit adi leela first chapter at least 15 to 20 times <laughs> nicely then prabhupada has very clearly explained all these things in his purport yes surya kund prabhu ji hari krishna prabhu ji talwa prabhu ji yeah. uh prabhu ji i was saying that uh, the sinful uh, activities uh, vanquish only after taking diksha or uh, Uh, the devotees who are just prabhupada ashray guru ashray they are chanting less than 16 round that process starts from there of vanquishing sinful activity now tell me how it has happened in your life uh, you my life uh, i felt uh, after diksha only yeah but before diksha also it happens before yeah, diksha because, when, you uh, in, when you come in touch with devotees when you start hearing bhagavad gita you slowly yeah. slowly start giving up bad habits Yes. and then you slowly slowly seriously get committed so that's how you know divyakyan is being given and the sin is slowly gradually getting destroyed and with diksha the process gets uh, a push a boost uh, so that's how that's how it happens that means that uh, that thing which you are putting in that uh, uh, that is the bad karma and good karma no all the pap and the punya gets slowly starts getting destroyed okay okay so we would like to finish today this uh, text file there is one more question maybe so who is this uh, hari naam sankirtan one can have only one diksha guru but there can be many shiksha gurus from whom we are taking instructions and guidance yes one can only have one diksha guru and he can have as many shiksha gurus ramancharya you know had many shiksha gurus my understanding is that diksha guru takes all our karma and assumes responsibility to take his disciples back to krishna whereas this is not for shiksha guru now this is not a right understanding that you know i take diksha and all the karma the spiritual master will take no <laughs> uh, it all depends on your surrender it all depends on how deeply you are surrender and in fact i i don't know whether i explained in this class or in the other class usually the spiritual master has to test the disciple whether he is fit and the disciple also has to test the spiritual master whether i'll be able to fully surrender to him follow his instructions throughout his life just like in the vedic tradition uh, the boy and girl their charts should match the boy and the girl should have compatibility and they both should meet each other and see that whether they should throughout continue uh, their marriage life and you know in the vedic tradition prabhupada said is there no question of divorce <laughs> divorce is unheard so similarly the disciple and the spiritual master you know observe each other and 
The, the disciple serves the spiritual master intimately and surrender is his heart. Surrender is a very deep thing. It is the soul. It is the heart which is surrendering to the spiritual master. It's a very deep commitment. It is a lifelong commitment. So today in ISKCON, we might come in touch with the spiritual master, but we might not have that association uh, to serve the spiritual master very rarely. But we, through their counselors, uh, we are connected to the spiritual master. And it is the counselor who recommends to the spiritual master and through the whole system, whatever administrative system is there. So even the counselor is held responsible if the disciple, uh, you know, uh, through whom counselor is connected to the spiritual master. And even the shiksha guru is held responsible <laughs> if the spiritual, if the disciple, you know, uh, is committing sins, then they also will get affected because their connection, the connection is there. <laughs> so you cannot, uh, you know, say like that that okay. I will take Diksha and all my karma, spiritual master will take. I will continue with my life like this. No. Krishna sees the intention and ultimately the spiritual master is like the cloud. And where is this cloud coming? It is coming from the ocean. So the spiritual master is like the ocean of Krishna's mercy who is showering on the disciples. And the Karma of the disciple, ultimately, uh, the spiritual master via medium, it goes to Krishna, to the ocean, and Krishna can dissolve it. But sometimes the spiritual master can get affected also because of it. So the disciple's duty is to see that his spiritual master should not suffer because of he being lax in practice of his Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada many times, you know, in his uh, past times, when he was sick, he said, because my disciples are not seriously practicing, I'm suffering, he said. Then the disciples immediately used to, you know. So this is also how it is a two-way process and we should not consider it like this. This is a very, we should have a very broad understanding of this. Okay, so we will continue with the discussion. We have understood the concept of Diksha now. It's a vast topic, but uh, there are a lot of question answers. Okay, oh, there's still a lot. Okay, now next we'll come to the next paragraph. Prabhupada, in this paragraph, this is paragraph, paragraph eight. Now, in paragraph eight, Prabhupada explains after explaining Diksha, how Prabhupada is giving his example how in Europe and America many students from the rich families come, they lose material interest in material enjoyment and they are eager to enter spiritual life. Although they are coming from wealthy families, they accept simple living conditions which are not very comfortable. Prabhupada disciples when they went to Mayapur to start the project they had so much health issues. They could not handle the Indian weather with these mosquitoes. Always they were getting typhoid, malaria, cholera. But they were all accepting these simple living conditions. Also they were from the Indies. And they are ready to live in the association of devotees. They are disinterested in material enjoyment. All these Prabhupada says, are the qualifications to become initiated by a spiritual master. And then Prabhupada speaks about how when we can advance in spiritual life by tapasya brahmacharena shamena damena. So one should do tapasya. Tapasya means to execute the order of the spiritual master, practice brahmacharya life, control the mind and senses. And then Prabhupada says when one is serious about accepting Vishnu, he should be he should be prepared to do this tapasya brahmacharya shamena. And if one is prepared and is desirous of receiving spiritual enlightenment, here Prabhupada is making that word clear, Divyam Jnana, he is fit to be initiated. So when he gets initiation, now Prabhupada gives down this understanding what I discussed. Divyam Jnana is technically called Tat Vijnana, knowledge about the Absolute or the Supreme. 
tad vidyanartham sa guru eva vidyachi so to get transcendental knowledge you have to go to the guru tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadikshanti te gyanam gyaninas tattvatarshina 4.34 in the bhagavad gita upadikshanti te gyanam so upadikshanti so that upadikshanti proper translates it as diksha Upa Dikshanti. So Upa Dikshanti, Prabhupada says, they will initiate. See, very, very clear it is. <clears throat> it's not just the physical process of the Harinam and the Mantra Diksha, which is also Diksha, but transcendental knowledge when we get, that is also initiation. So I'm not speculating, but it's all coming from Prabhupada's explanation and purpose and i know many devotees are not so clear about these topics so upadikshanti and then proper course also tasmat guru prapadete jigyashraya uttamam one should not accept a spiritual master without following his instructions see proper is making very clear what is surrender now i'll explain today in a family context please try to understand this example uh, a chaste wife should be surrendered to the husband and what is surrender and chastity for the wife is to follow the instructions of the husband similarly surrender to the spiritual master is also very similar that the disciple will follow the instructions of the spiritual master. That is surrender. So that is why uh, if you feel, this is also, uh, I, I can tell uh, like a gauge or a barometer for you to check uh, which spiritual master I should take initiation. Ask this question. If this spiritual master, if I'm taking initiation, I will I be surrendered that I will follow his instructions and not disobey his instructions? Because if you disobey the instructions, then you'll do Guru Avagya, the third offense. So I'm giving you my personal example here uh, just to make the point clear. Otherwise, I would not like to speak. Uh, when I joined uh, way back in 2002, I first heard the first lecture from a sannyasi. And I was very attracted that in you know, lecture what I heard for six months, it was lingering in my mind. And then later on, I joined the temple. And then in the course of two, three years, I heard various spiritual masters and I was attracted to all of them because of their presentation of the philosophy. So I could not decide you know, which spiritual master I should take initiation. I like this spiritual master's presentation also. I like his presentation also. I like his. Then a question came to me. I had to decide now. I had to take initiation and uh, I was asked, you know, whom you would like to take. So I also carefully deliberated for almost a year. And then this question came to me that whom I would like to be more surrendered to? Where is my surrender uh, more inclining towards? And based on that, uh, I decided that I'll take initiation from this spiritual master. So Prabhupada in Bhagavad Gita 2.7, Tadvidhi, uh, not, uh, what is that verse? Karpanya dosho pahata sobhava prakchami tvam dharma sammuda cheta yashraya swan nishchitam bruhi shishya steham shadi tvam prapanya. When Arjuna surrenders to Krishna, in that one lecture, Prabhupada says that he gives the example of uh, how a person, he sees that there are many women out there, but he's attracted to a particular woman. And he marries her and he considers her as his wife. So similarly, Prabhupada says, where is our heart affinity flowing? Now here, when I mean the heart, it is the soul, soul affinity. Where is it to, you know, to which spiritual master it is going? So here is one indication. Then Prabhupada says, one should not accept a spiritual master just for fashion. Oh, I also have a spiritual master. You know, 
just to show in the outside world, you know, as a, <laughs> just like you have a degree like that. So one must be Jigyasu to learn from a spiritual master. And you should only inquire about transcendental subject matter from a spiritual master. The inquiry one should make strictly pertain to the transcendental science of Jigyasu Shre Uttamam. Uttamam means above material knowledge. Tama is darkness. Uttama means transcendental knowledge. People are interested in about mundane inquiry. What about my house? Whether I'll increase my bank balance or whether I'll make this business. But when one has lost such interest and is simply interested in transcendental subject matters, is fit to be initiated. When one is actually initiated by a bona fide spiritual master, and when he seriously engages in the service of the Lord, he should be accepted as a Madhyamadhikari. So here in these two paragraphs, how from a Kanishta one you know, comes to the Madhyama platform is what Prabhupada is speaking. Firstly, uh, in paragraph 8 and 9, qualities of one desiring to be initiated is mentioned. Loses interest in material enjoyment, is eager for spiritual life, for Krishna's sake, he is ready to live in any condition. He is serious about accepting the Diksha. He is ready to practice Tapasya Brahmacharya and Shamayana Dharmacharya. And he is desirous of refusing transcendental knowledge. He becomes initiated. How one becomes initiated as a Vaishnava? Then, how a Kanishta Vaishnava progresses to Madhyam? He is Jigyasu, strictly of transcendental science. He is actually initiated and he seriously engages in service of the Lord. So the transition from Kanishta to Madhyama is uh, mentioned in these two paragraphs. Now, our whole advancement in Krishna consciousness from the Kanishta to the Madhyama to the Uttama is based on the chanting. So, Prabhupada here speaks about chanting in the next paragraph. That is paragraph 9. Oh, sorry, paragraph 10 it is. Now, paragraph 10 is speaking about, let me go to the themes. Three kinds of, understanding the three kinds of Vaishnavas on the basis of chanting the holy names. This is Kulina Gramvasis who had asked Mahaprabhu. One who takes the name of Krishna once is a Vaishnava, Mahaprabhu defined. And Nirandarna, one who is always taking the name of Krishna, is a Madhyam. And one who inspires others to take the name of Krishna and he can transform them into devotees, he is a Mahabhagavat. So that Kulina Gramvasi discussion is there in paragraph 10 and 11 here. So here Prabhupada is mentioning the chanting of the holy names of Krishna is so sublime that if one chants the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra offenselessly, carefully avoiding the ten offenses, he can certainly be gradually elevated to the point of understanding that there is no difference between the holy name of the Lord and the Lord himself. So when is one a Madhya Madhikari? Not from the Nam point of view. Nama Nami. If you are chanting Nama Prad, you cannot realize this that the holy name is conscious and it is Nama, it is Rasa Vigra. When you chant the holy name, you are tasting Rasa, spiritual Rasa, and you realize it is a conscious living being. It is a person. That's why he is called as Nama Prabhu. Abhinnatvam Nama. Chaitanya Rasa Vigra. Nama Chintamani Chaitanya Rasa Vigra. Nitya Mukto Purna Shuddho Abhinnatvam Nama Nama. So when you come to the point of your chanting where you realize that the holy name is not different from the Lord, then you are relishing the Nama Ras and actually that time you start doing Nama Seva. Now what is Nama Seva? That you preach. Because there is so much nectar. Please, you also have this nectar. And that Jeeva Daya comes out. Hmm? Jeeva Daya, Nama Ruchi, Sarva Dharma, Sar. So Nama Ruchi only when you get, then you can do Jeeva Daya. 
So that is why a Madhyam Adhikari is only a preacher in one sense. So all of us again can use this as a benchmark to realize whether we are committing offense in our chanting or yes or no. If we are getting Nam Ras and we are doing preaching and genuinely Nam Seva, then we are on that platform. Otherwise, we are at the Nama Prat platform. One who has reached such an understanding should be very much respected by neophyte devotees. So the neophytes also respect the senior devotees. We know that. One should know for certain that without chanting the holy name of the Lord offenselessly, one cannot be a proper candidate for advancement in Krishna consciousness. Please mark this statement in your books. <laughs> That without chanting the holy name offenselessly, you cannot advance. That means you have to uh, cross the Nama Prat stage quickly and come to the Nama Bhas stage. Only when the Nama Bhas stage, you can advance quickly in Krishna consciousness. So Nama Prat means you are doing offense. Now, which is the root of all offenses? This is all very important. Maybe we might little stretch today the class, uh, but it is very important. Now, which is the root of all offenses? Which is the root of all offenses? Nama Prad, we commit. Raise your hand. Who would like to answer? Uh, Lakshmi Mataji. Mm. Uh, Yes, let me unmute you. Yes, Mataji? If they don't have faith. They don't have faith. Okay. Uh, somebody has typed as mind is the root of all offenses. Madan Mohan Prabhuji. Madan Mohan Prabhuji, I would like to hear from you. Yeah, Prabhu, the main offense is when we do Vaishnava Parada. That is Aparad, but while chanting, which is the root of all offenses we commit? Santana Lakshmi Mataji. Yes, Mataji. I have unmuted you. Santana Lakshmi Mataji. Okay, no response, but there is one more. Uh, not fully surrender. No, no. Okay, you can type. Not chanting rounds regularly. No, no, no. Poonam Mataji. Uncontrolled mind. That is a different issue. Material desire. That is a different issue. Which is the root of all offenses we commit while chanting? Uh, Harinam Sankirtan. Prabhuji. Yes. Yes, Prabhuji. What I feel is the uncontrolled mind. But you mentioned that that is not the one. But no. my, yeah, this is the root. I mean, mind, mind engaged in various material <laughs> activities. Everyone is missing the point. He is missing the point. Puna Mataji has once again raised the hand. Yes, Mataji. Prabhuji, is it a tongue? Tongue? Okay. Like Not when a we, when There's only our Iva devotees who have typed the correct answer, but none of all others are. It's all, that's all secondary, I feel. The root of all offenses is inattentive chanting, inattention. Now, uh, here, just to give you a hint of what is inattentive chanting, uh, there are many Matajis. How many of you have children here uh, can raise their hands? How many of you have children? One, two, three. Okay. Okay. So we'll ask the Mataji only the question. Okay, Lata Mataji, I'll ask you the question. Okay, okay, okay. So all, almost all have. 
Now, Lata Mataji, I, I'll ask you a question. Suppose your kid comes and is speaking to you and you focus your concentration on something else other than putting your heart and your consciousness in what your kid is saying. What will happen? Will that kid recognize? Will your kid recognize it or no? Yes or no? No, Prabhu. No. Suppose your kid comes running to you and she's, she or he is speaking to you. You know? And you are hearing your kid and suddenly you divert your attention to something else. Will the kid recognize it or no? Hmm? The kid will, uh, kid will recognize that. It will recognize. It will recognize. Why the kid will recognize is because it is a conscious being. The kid is a conscious being. And the kid has love for you and he is speaking from the heart with, you know, because we have a loving reciprocation as a mother and son. So when he is opening his, he or she is opening the heart to the mother and speaking, and if the mother, even for a moment, even for a moment, if the mother's attention goes to some other topic, the kid can recognize. Maybe she'll say, Mama, see here, I am speaking to you. So, if a kid can recognize this, then what about Krishna, who is a supreme conscious being and he is seated in our heart? He is seated in our heart. So, when we chant, the first thing we need to do is we should be conscious that Krishna is present in the name. I am calling out Krishna and Krishna is conscious that I am chanting his name and I should focus exclusively on the name and nothing else. If you divert your attention to anything else, then you commit Namaprath. You should put your heart into your chanting, not your lips and your tongue. You should put your heart into your chanting. So this is the root of the offense and it is up to us now how many years you want to stay and do inattentive chanting and be in the Namaprath stage. You can decide, resolve it today. So that is why uh, in the Bhagavad Gita 10.10 .10, Mat Chitta Mat Gata Prana Bhoda Yanta Parasparam Katas Chanta Maam Nityam Tushyanti Cha Raman teacher. So in this purport, Srila Prabhupada, uh, I will share the screen. Srila Prabhupada quotes Balde Vidya Bhushan. And he mentions, he mentions, uh, does the realized souls in Krishna consciousness take continual pleasure in hearing such transcendental literatures? Just as a young boy and girl take pleasure in association. So, a transcendental realization is spoken about pure devotees and it is completely coming down to a mundane platform of a young boy and a young girl. Now, uh, this uh, Balde Vidya Bhushan, actually Prabhupada is quoting Balde Vidya Bhushan here. Now, <clears throat> when the young boy has given his heart to the girl, he is sitting in the garden and his heart is given to the girl and he is simply absorbed in the beauty of the girl and the sweet talk of the girl. So when his heart is open, his mind doesn't function. He doesn't know to do things to today. You know, he's not, you know, where is my laptop? Where is my mobile? You know, what are the two? Completely is cut off from this world. Why? Because he has given his heart to the girl. So just like the young boy is absorbed in the girl, and if the girl recognizes that he is not, you know, he's, his consciousness is not focused on me, immediately she will leave the place. Immediately she will leave the place. Yeah. So Krishna also is conscious being who is seated in the heart. The moment you take your attention away from the holy name, 
Krishna is not present in that holy name, and then you do what is called as mechanical chanting, and you have to deal with the mind. And you chant your 16 rounds, your mind has wandered all over the universe and has come back. So this is inattentive chanting. So I am giving an important principle and a sutra to avoid inattentive chanting. When the heart is open, the mind is closed. The young boy's heart is open to the girl, his mind is not functioning at all. He's completely absorbed. And when the mind is open, the heart is closed. So chant your rounds from your heart. Keep the pictures of the deities whom we are very attracted to. It can be Radha Gopinath, Radha Madhav, Radha Sham Sundar, where our heart is naturally you know, attracted to. And you chant for their pleasure. Chanting is not to finish our 16 rounds. Chanting is for the pleasure of Radha and Krishna. In that mood, we need to chant. And then you can become free from inattentive chanting and you can free from become free from the uncontrolled mind and all these things. Put your heart into your chanting. So that was something about uh, Prabhupada's statement, which is a very, very, uh, you know, what you can say, it is like throwing you out <laughs> from your, uh, bringing you to reality that if you don't, if you chant uh, inattentively, you cannot make advancement. One should know for certain without chanting the holy names, the Lord offenses me. One cannot be a proper candidate for advancement in Krishna consciousness. Then Prabhupada goes on to define uh, Omal Shraddha, Kanishta, Krame Krame Tenohoi Bhakta Uttam. This we have seen. Uh, Sanatan Shiksha. We have seen this. And then in the next paragraph, <clears throat> Prabhupada mentions about. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Satya Raj Khan definitions based on taking the holy name. One who takes the holy name once is a Vaishnava. And such a Vaishnava should be respected. Prabhupada only quotes the Kanishta, but we saw in the slide the Uttama, the Madhyama next year, which was given to Satya Raj Khan explanation. And in the next year, the third year, the Vaishna Pradhan, that is Uttamadhikari. And after these verses, the next verse is here. If you want, you can have a look. So, yeah, it is here. Shrishta Sabakhar. And then he quotes, uh, then, uh, oh, this Piksha Purushavari is there. No, we will not go to that. Sorry. It is in the next year he quotes uh, next to next year. And then after that, he quotes this verse uh, that uh, therefore, anyway, the Kanishta who takes the name of Krishna once, later on he'll come in the association, he'll start taking Nirantar and he'll become a Shuddha Vaishnava. Therefore, Vaishnava should be respected. Atayeva Yandra Muke Eka Krishna Nam Saite Vaishnava. He is a Vaishnava. Kariya Tahar Samman. You should respect him. And this is also annoying what it is speaking. And Prabhupada is translating this in the Chaitanya Charitamrit Mandilila. Now Prabhupada gives an example of how he speaks about one of our friends, he says, not my friend. A famous English musician. Whom is Prabhupada referring here to? Anyone knows? Can type in the chat box. Anyone knows? Beatles, especially George Harrison. So he says that he became attracted to chanting the holy names. And in his record, he has mentioned about Krishna's name. He offers respect to Krishna's pictures. And he is very respectful to the preachers of Krishna consciousness. He is very respectful to Shamsundar Prabhu. And he has high estimation of Krishna's name and Krishna's activity. And Prabhupada says, therefore, we offer respects to him without reservation. And we see that he is actually making advancement. Such a person should be shown respect. The conclusion is that 
anyone who is trying to advance in Krishna consciousness by regularly chanting the holy name should always be respected by Vaishnavas. Always. So, an uh, important sutra uh, we can take from this uh, text file discussion. How many of us are very serious to chant the holy names, attain Krishna Prem? Raise your hands. Let us see. Not all, huh? <laughs> Only eight have raised their hands. Still few more are remaining. Maybe they are not present in the discussion now. Let me. So this is the sutra. Sakale sammana korite shakati deho nata yata yata. Tabe to gaebo hari nama aparada hobe yata. Sakale samman means respect every living being and respect Vaishnavas according to their level. Kanishta, how we should respect Madhyama and Uttama. So if you can do this kind of activity in your life, you will be able to take Nirantar Nam and attain Krishna Prem. I don't know about me, but at least you all might be able to do it. In the Kapil Shiksha, that is in the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 25, when Mother Devuti says, I'm being troubled and harassed by material desires. And when she puts this question, Kapil Dev says, practice Siddha Bhakti. Siddha Bhakti means pure devotional service at the perfected stage. And how in this perfected stage, one is relishing Krishna's beauty, he's actually having darshan of Krishna and what he's experiencing, all that Kapil Dev explains. And then in chapter 25, after 25, this chapter, in 26 and 27, he explains how by Gyan Yoga one can attain liberation. First is Sankhya, the 24 elements, and how by the process of Gyan Yoga one can get liberated. Kapil Dev gives explanation. In chapter 28, how by Ashtang Yoga one can get liberation, <coughs> Kapil Dev speaks. In chapter 29, Mother Devuti says, I have heard about Bhakti Yoga, Gyan Yoga and Ashtang Yoga. I feel Bhakti Yoga process is easy for attaining the highest form of liberation in the form of becoming an associate of the Lord. By Gyan and Ashtang Yoga, we can get impersonal liberation. But personal liberation is possible only by Bhakti Yoga. Now, please speak about Bhakti Yoga. Devuti Mata That time, Kapil Dev explains sadhana bhakti. And after defining sadhana bhakti, he says sadhana bhakti should lead to sadhya. Sadhya means perfection, shuddha bhakti. And Kapil Dev says that usually uh, sadhana bhakti will not mature into siddha bhakti because <clears throat> one doesn't respect Vaishnavas. And then he goes on to explain how there are living entities at different, different levels of consciousness. He starts with the plants, then the insects, then the moving, then the birds, comes to the human beings. Within the human beings, there is a Varnasham, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaisha, Shudra. Within the Brahmanas, there is a Brahmagya. There is a Brahmagya. There is a Brahmagya. Brahmagya means one who has learned the Vedas. Then there is another person, I don't recollect the term, one who not only knows the Vedas, but he can explain it to others. So all these living entities who are at different, different levels of consciousness, uh, Kapil Dev mentions. Why does he mention this is so that based on their level of consciousness, one should respect them accordingly. And if we respect them, then we can niraparad sakale sammana korite shakati deho nata yatha yatha. Give me the strength to respect every living being and all the Vaishnavas according to their level. Tabe to gaibo. Then I can what? Sing harinama niraparad without any offenses. Prabhupada speaks about how he gives respect to George Harrison. Then he says, on the other hand, we have witnessed that some of our contemporaries who are supposed to be great preachers 
have gradually fallen into the material conception of life because they have failed to chant the holy name of the law <laughs> of the Lord. Prabhupada is here speaking about his grand brothers who are criticizing him and finding faults with him. So that is also a kind of a So we should be also <coughs> sorry, careful about it. So there are last few paragraphs remaining, which we will take up in the next class. And in the next class also, we will finish one more verse. <coughs> Sorry. So, any questions, any clarifications you have? Today we took another 10 or 15 minutes more because uh, we started a little late. Anyone has any question? I saw one of the devotees, his video is on, but he was speaking also on the phone. <laughs> inattentive hearing is also offense, not only inattentive chanting. While reading the Bhagavatam, if you are not attentive while reading, then you are committing offense. While hearing the class, when the speaker is speaking in the Srimad Bhagavatam class, which you have, every, I think, Friday morning you go to the temple and now, not because of COVID, but you go and hear. When we are hearing, if we no, don't hear attentively, that is also offense. And inattentive chanting is also an offense. So we should be careful about it. Uh, anyone has questions? Because there are six raised hands raised. I think that was based on the previous question which I had asked, I guess. Apart from that, anyone has any questions? Unam Mataji, you have a question? Yes, Prabhuji. Prabhuji, can you please again uh, tell the meaning of uh, the Vaishnava, the Vaishnava, the person who chanted the 16 round, apart from that? A Vaishnava, a broad understanding is anyone who takes the name of Krishna once, according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He's a Vaishnava. Yandra Muke Shune Ekabar Krishna Sei Vaishnava Shreshta Sabakar. That is the definition of Mahaprabhu. Prabhu Kahe Yandra Muke Shune Ekabar. Once Krishna Sei Puja. He is to be offered respect and he is the best among all the other living beings. So he is a Vaishnava. Arta Eva Seite Vaishnava. Arta Eva Yamuke Eka Krishna. Arta Eva, therefore, anyone who takes one Krishna name, Seite Vaishnava. Ariyatahar, you should respect him. So this is what one is. Uh, so, Prabhuji, uh, so who is then Kanishta Adhikari? They also come in the Vaishnava? Yes, they also are within the Vaishnava platform. Now, again, Kanishta, you, when you say from which perspective we have to ask, whether it is from the Bhagavatam perspective or Bhakti Rasamrit perspective, okay. from which angle? All are Vaishnavas who are chanting, but even the Prakart Sergias are also Vaishnavas. We just offer them respect. But in our devotee circle, are all also Vaishnavas. But again, in our devotee circle, there can be Vaishnavas at different, different levels. So that's how we'll have to understand. We have to have a broad understanding and also a general understanding. Not general, in fact, a specific understanding of who is a Vaishnava. Is it okay. clear? Yes, Prabhupada. Thank you. So, Santana Lakshmi Mataji has a question. Uh, I will unmute you. Yes, Mataji. First time you are asking a question. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Can you call Shakura as Madhima Dikari Prabhu? Your voice is not clear because I think you are on the mobile and hearing. That's why there is some you know, disturbance. Maybe you can type it. Yes, Prabhu. 
Yeah, Nitya Sevini Mataji has a question. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Prabhu, yes. just now we have discussed uh, which one is the Avrada while chanting, right? That is, uh, is unconscious chanting is also unattentive chanting, right? Yes, when you are not conscious that, you know, my child is speaking to me and your consciousness diverts to something else, the child can detect. Yes. And you commit Avrada to your child and she becomes upset with you. Yeah, that's what I wrote, Prabhu. That, that uh, answer I wrote in the chat was, I think you missed that one. Okay, you, uh, yes, yeah, Prabhu. I did not maybe see the chat box. Yes, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Okay, I'm not pronouncing. Not pronouncing the Harinam properly. Yes. No, Prabhu. Unconscious, unconscious chanting. About that one is. Yeah, yes, yes. And in fact, it's also that we should pronounce the mantra very clearly and distinctly also. Very clearly. Very clearly you should pronounce the mantra. That is also important. Prabhupada speaks about that in the Chaitanya Charita Amrit. Also. Okay. Uh, fine. So today we little short of, of the time. Uh, uh, sorry for that. And uh, there is also last point which our Mohan Rup Sham Prabhu has brought out. What is the word limit for the assignment, Prabhu? And the word limit is between 300 to 500 words. And uh, okay, I'll speak.